Thank you all for being here. It's, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to talking to you about Helen Frankenthaler's work today, and in particular, the mountains and sea. And it's a large painting, 10 by seven feet, and it sort of gets right to the question of, wow, what does one do in an art history class? What is it all even about? I mean, uh, to be looking at this picture in the National Gallery of Art, where it's been for many years in Washington, DC, or or, um, or for that matter, virtually in a Stanford classroom and so on. I mean, how, what, what are the stakes of looking at a picture like this and what are the demands that it places on us? And I, I do wanna to suggest today that there's an ethical power, if you like, to um, what works of art like this um, have to offer us. So, you know, it's, uh, it looks almost to be a, like a vast watercolor uh, you've heard me say it's 10 by seven feet. It's actually oil paint thinned with turpentine. Um, uh, a picture that is, uh, per the title, is evoking the landscape of Nova Scotia where Helen Frankenthaler had visited in summer of 52, um, you know, with the mountains and the sea coming together there. Who was this person who made this picture? Classic. Photograph, speaking of college, there's Helen Frankenthaler um, at Bennington College, her senior year, 1948. And we might look at this picture much as we look at photographs of smiling students um, now and think that everything is fine. But of course, photographs are at the very least misleading. They're also, um, even the smiles are complicated, right? So. Um, Helen was known all her life for a great smile and uh, a wonderful laugh, but uh, a very complex person. So what can I tell you here? Helen uh, came from a very well-to-do family in uh, Manhattan, Upper East Side. Her father was a New York State Supreme Court judge, uh, but he died of a relatively sudden illness when she was 11 years old. In 1940, and Helen was, by her own description, for much of her adolescence, a mess. So she had a series of psychosomatic illnesses. Uh, she was terrified and anxious. Uh, she used to be very afraid, for example, when her mother would run just even a basic errand, uh, fearing that her mother would never come back, etc. It was only art uh, in high school that really began to save. Helen and gave her a respite, an outlet, an escape, I want to say, though her art turns out to be much more than uh, an escape, but let's call it a lifeline for right now. But I want to come back to the smile in this photograph and just say that it's, it's not wrong, you know, it's not misleading, as I said. Um, Helen's best friend at Bennington was the daughter of Groucho Marx, Miriam Marx. Miriam, who wrote a column in the student newspaper called Re Marx, like R-E colon M-A-R-X, very much in her father's vein of humor, smart alecky, wisecracking. Miriam Marx, she was, you know, she was uh, crazy. She was wild and she ultimately got kicked out of school. I'm just trying to say, you know, I'm all for education, but I'm trying to say that um, Helen was, um, not as wild as her friend Miriam, but she was, um, you know, she was a brash and confident and intellectually, um, you know, uh, voracious, uh, inquisitive uh, student like many Bennington students. Okay, the, the other thing I'll say about this is, as an example of that is her senior year, uh, Helen went down to New York City with a friend, um, really keen to see this new play called A Streetcar Named Desire. And they, they really wanted to, uh, they really wanted to interview Marlon Brando and, you know, with sufficient chutzpah, they, they hung around at uh, the end of a matinee show and um, spoke to a theater employee who was able to go backstage and get them an interview with Marlon Brando, which took place the following day, a very rushed fashion in a cafeteria down the street from the theater in which between mouthfuls of, of food that Brando was eating more or less as Stanley Kowalski, uh, he gave these co-eds some advice about how one is successful in art. 
the, the story was published in the student newspaper, uh, a Brando uh, called Desire, I think is, is the title of that essay. Anyway, um, brash, confident, also interested in how you make it in the art world. Once Helen graduated in 1949, she moved back to Manhattan and there not long after um, a photographer for Life Magazine finds her there on the right uh, with her best friend, Gabby Rogers, whose real name is Gabby Rosenberg uh, uh, at a costume ball for an artist benefit um, society or for an artist organization, a benefit ball. The Hotel Astor, the ninth floor ballroom. You can see how vast the ceiling is. There are different uh, mobiles hanging from uh, the ceiling and different kinds of surrealist motifs. Uh, there's Helen at age 21. Gabby is basically the same age. Um, Gabby's dressed as a fashion model, and indeed she went on to become a Hollywood actress, appearing in the movie directed by Robert Aldrich called uh, Kiss Me Deadly in 1955, excellent movie, um, in which she has a lead part. And then Helen, who's dressed as, uh, this is where the art history kicks in, dressed as uh, a Picasso, um, Picasso's girl with a mirror with um, a mop for a hair, for hair, for yellow hair, uh, balloons for displaced breasts, uh, a mirror indeed in her left hand, dime store mirror, uh, and then a shower curtain as the background uh, that one sees in that painting. So um, uh, Helen is the life of the party, the bell of the ball already. This, um, uh, even though she's yet to accomplish anything in the art world, and indeed this, this ball featured so many established artists there, but Helen didn't care about that. She knew she was good. She knew she was talented. Um, now, what was that talent or was it fulfilled at that point? This is a painting that Helen made that same year called Woman on a Horse. And you could see that her affection for Picasso, whose mode of painting she had learned at Bennington, uh, is in full force in this picture. You can see there's the corner of a room there at the lower right. So it's a kind of an odd or non sequitur kind of picture that there's a woman on a horse in a room, but you can see the Picasso mode. And in fact, the very painting that, that Helen emulated in the ball is a worthy example or a comparison to woman on a horse and shows you how directly, honorifically, she was riffing on the, this uh, master of modern art. And this painting on the right is was and is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, well known to Helen. Uh, Helen proudly displayed her Woman on a Horse, which was her state-of-the-art picture at a show of art of Bennington alums in that year, 1950. And, you know, the varnish was still on it and everything, and she's quite proud of it. And she brought a very distinguished guest trying to drum up some publicity for this show. Uh, this man, Clement Greenberg, who was uh, the most influential and really the, the worthiest, uh, most brilliant art critic in New York at that time. And what can I say? Well, two things I'll tell you. One is, as you look at this photograph of him, I, I sort of imagine it basically portraying his attitude as he looked at woman on a horse because he didn't like it. And he didn't know that Helen had painted it. That is the woman he had just met who was giving him a tour of the show. But he said, "Why I don't like that one. And she laughed. And what can I say? They began to hit it off. Greenberg was 20 years her senior. He was born in 1909. He's from a um, Jewish family in the Bronx. Um, and Helen was uh, born in 1928, but they began this relationship, which uh, had some very powerful benefits for Helen, not least of which was that Greenberg, who had discovered Jackson Pollock, if, if you'll accept that term, discover, who had really vouched for Pollock's quality uh, and not been wrong, took her to in later in 1952, uh, Betty Parsons Gallery, you're seeing it here, um, no, late November, early December, 1950, to see Pollock's new drip painting show. And there's an elevator that goes up to this uh, space and 
as they got off the elevator, Greenberg actually kind of lagged behind and said, you, you go out in there and you just kind of sink or swim. You, you take this in on your own, right? And Helen described it later as, it was sort of like being landed in Lisbon and not speaking Portuguese, but desperately wanting to speak the language. Uh, she couldn't believe it. And looking at pictures like the one head on here, which is called Autumn Rhythm, and which you can see at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, now eight by 17 feet, she was blown away by the freedom uh, of these works. She didn't know anything like this was possible. This was not Picasso or something like this. It was totally different. And um, she was stunned. I, I think it's without hesitation that this was uh, the most formative moment in her life and her artistic life. Uh, to this point. And it was not just becoming associated or looking at Pollock's work. It was also socializing with Pollock there on the right, um, along with on the far left, his wife, the painter Lee Krasner, and then Greenberg, and then Helen there. So we're looking at people who were, you've got Krasner born in 1908, Greenberg born in 1909, Pollock was born in 1912 and then Helen 1928. So she's a neophyte here, but she's right there, not intimidated and yet also awestruck. You know, this year, 1951, that features her in this photograph at this nightclub, um, also features her out there in the dunes of the Hamptons where Pollock's studio was, where he made pictures like Autumn Rhythm and swearing a an oath of youthful and undying allegiance to Pollock, uh, uh, that is doing so, swearing this oath in company with another young painter named Larry Rivers saying, will always be true to his example of an absolute freedom in, in painting. So um, it wasn't long then before Helen's art begins to morph and that same year, 1951, so we're, we're basically now about 16 months after the Astor, Hotel Astor Ball. Helen has her own first, her first one person show and it's at a new upstart gallery called Tibor Dinage on East 53rd Street. On the right is the director of that gallery, John Bernard Myers. You can see Helen, you can also see Greenberg right there. The other person is Al Leslie who um, is just as thin today uh, as he was in his 20s. He's one of the people I really had such a great connection with in writing this book and interviewing um, who knew Helen then. In any case, um, Helen is advocating for which picture should hang where. You can see there are two works there. One is a small one between her and Myers. The other behind her is called Sightseers. And I ask you to just think of your, you know, think art historically here and just say, wow, I, I totally get this, that um, with or without Professor Nemirov, like if, um, if I were looking at seated on a woman on a horse from one year and then this from the next year, I would understand that something had happened, right? That there was a difference. Now, it's not Pollock-like exactly, but in fact, not at all. Um, you know, it's not painted on the floor as Pollock painted, et cetera, but something has changed here and we don't see the, the Picasso figures or anything like that. And we see something much more uh, in the manner of an all over abstraction. And so Sightseers is much closer to the picture that I'm focusing on tonight, um, Mountains and Sea from the next year. And indeed the date at the bottom of it, you can see 10, 26, 52, or if you can't see, it's in the lower right corner, very neatly inscribed. Um, it's closer to, Sightseers is closer to this picture than to Woman on a Horse. So there's this dramatic evolution taking place on the part of someone who's extremely young. And I think one of the tricks for us as we look at this where, you know, art is art, style is style, individuality is, um, what it is, you be you, iPhone, iPad, i this, i that, is that, uh-uh. It was totally different in 1950, 51, 52. You were going to the mat with what you painted. It was you. It wasn't some 
iterable, fashionable change of the ever-changing you who could don costumes as the weather and the mood uh, suggested. No, it was it was like all to the mat, wall to wall, 100%. I'm staking everything on this picture. And so we need to think about that a little bit as we think about the revolution of mountains and sea, though, again, I haven't really even said what that revolution might exactly be. Let's, let's think about the relation to Pollock here. And, you know, the photographs by Hans Namath, like the one on the left, became very famous uh, as soon as they were made, showing him basically dancing almost in a kind of Brando-like physical, muscular, uh, you know, um, choreography around these pictures, painting them from all four sides. Um, Helen's mode on the right is taken from, proudly taken from Pollock's improvisational mode of creativity. Uh, you can see there are plenty of differences, um, but her, her mode of working, this is a photograph from a little later in the 50s, not of her painting Mountains and Sea, but another picture, but her mode of of working is comparably graceful, um, choreographed, um, physical and intellectual at the same time. I, I always love the concentrated look on her face here. And what one is trying to do here, uh, you know, with something like this, or it's not just an emulation of Pollock's style, it's trying to um, make a kind of art that is free and alive, that is not just becoming a stultified, fossilized rendition of life, which, you know, with all, in all fairness, you could say woman on a horse is somewhat, somewhat calls those negatives to mind, but is instead something as free and lyrical as the breeze, as the wind in the trees, as the bird in the tree, as the light playing on the wall, things like that. What is it like to be alive? And Pollock more than anyone else seem to be able to portray that feeling of aliveness in a picture without killing it. And this is what Helen, who was, remember that smile was totally about life, about living life. And even to within an inch of, um, you know, saving her living life because she knew what kind of horrors and desperations and tragedies lay and, and awaited one if one did not try to live um, fulsomely, um, vibrantly. Uh, so this is active kinds of drip paintings looked at all alike, right? Because uh, they didn't. Uh, and there's a Pollock painting you can see at the Tate Modern in London, which is one that Helen particularly admired, but she was never trying to imitate Pollock. That was impossible anyway. And anyway, she had her own experiences, her own sensations to um, try to portray. Now, you know, this all seems to be building towards some truly feel good story. Never a doubt. I've said she was totally committed to art, but life is so much more complicated, right? Than our narratives make it out to be. And if you look at the date again, 10, 26, 52, lower right corner, just so much going on in Helen's life in October of 52 that was not about art. For one, she was really thinking of giving up art and if I show you a detail of Mountains and Sea, that inscription of the date, and indeed it was painted in just a few hours, one afternoon, that afternoon, that very month, in fact, on October 6th um, itself, the date of the magazine on the left, um, Helen was writing about an alternate path, which was namely to get a job at life, at time life. Basically, maybe I should just give up being an artist. What's the point? Um, and, you know, if she hadn't been so totally put off by the whole time life experience, which was its own kind of Silicon Valley, I suppose, um, campus like experience then put off in the sense of finding it to be, in her words, very stuffy with Yale and Vassar types, very highly educated, smart, you know, it just felt like, you know, although she was as smart as anyone, it just felt like not her world, not her people. But she was, the fact that she was even thinking of this, and you can see the model of femininity that this magazine is portraying as a house style is, 
is noteworthy because, you know, again, our narratives about, oh, the artist was always going to do this is, are, are always uh, trickier, right? Van Gogh was a preacher before he was an artist. Um, second thing, October 52, you know, when I look at that date, 10, 26, 52, I think of the presidential election, which was coming up the, the next week, November 4th, uh, between the Republican Eisenhower and the Democrat Adlai Stevenson. And Helen had been asked in October to serve on a committee, a kind of local, a New York committee for uh, women for Stevenson. And the very fact that she was mulling this was also indicative of like, yeah, what's um, the, the world, the world that would, you know, uh, elect Eisenhower, you know, basically a landslide, 442 votes to 89 on November 4th was right there, right there pressing on this person who made this picture and yet she made it. So let me just say what I think is at stake in this and which we now understand is made by someone who is not only evolved in her art, involved in her personal relationships, but is also struggling with certain decisions that uh, a person in their 20s often has to make. What should I do? Uh, what is right for me? The thing I care most about seems so unnoticed, yet I, I'm convinced that it's for me in some ways. What's at stake in her making this picture? And moreover, in making it after several hours and then saying, I'm not gonna make another mark on it. I'll give you three, three very brief, um, uh, I guess, um, ideas about why what, what's at stake for her and probably for us too then. One is, uh, Helen said, the lightest touch is the strongest gesture of all. So she was someone, you know, who was encouraged to finish things that is shape, round, outline, harden, calcify her work into like the most kind of almost you know, sculptural finished frozen dimensions and designs as possible, you know, but no, she's going to leave this off just like this. And this is the way I put that light touch comment or how I think of it. It's, she was so good at taking, at bringing a painting just to the point where it is a painting and then stopping, you know, just when it's beginning to cohere. And people used to spit at this picture on it, spit at it on it used to say it was just a giant, remember 10 by seven foot turpentine rag. Uh, it was unrecognizable as a painting. Uh, the only people who even thought of buying a Helen work at this time, and certainly not one this big, were friends of her late father who in hushed tones approached the gallerist and said that, you know, I'll buy one of uh, Mr. Frankenthaler's daughter's pictures, not because they liked it, but because they felt it was a dutiful thing to do. So incredible guts and confidence to just praise the light touch. Second thing, back at Bennington, Helen had a beloved professor, a sociologist named Eric Fromm, F-R-O-M-M, -M, uh, European emigre, who, who wrote a book called Escape from Freedom, Escape from Freedom. And his hypothesis was that Americans uh, uh, flee the very freedom that is given to them as though in terror from an existential, you know, well, as, as, in, as from an existential state of terror, right? That's why with any free time, Americans fill their bellies with heavy roadhouse meals or watch totally unenjoyable movies or take long drives for no reason. It's just the idea of just being, you know, of just, if you like, watching the wind hit the trees or seeing surf gently rise on the beach or staring at, I don't know, the eyelashes or earlobes of a loved one or a family member, you know, the stroke of a finger on a piece of wood, uh, watching a candle, whatever the case may be, all of it, sensation, physical sensation and, and the emotions we feel on a day on earth is just to be ignored, hid, repressed, right? This is, I, I don't want, I don't want to go there, right? Uh, let's go to a movie. Let me check my email, as it were, right? So Helen is saying, this is freedom, actually. This is what it looks like. 
And of course we can say, hey, you be you. Great, awesome, amazing. That's another good one or slightly better than interesting. That's so interesting, right? So freedom, one of the perils of freedom is that it gets mistaken for being waste of time or being frivolous. When in fact, Helen teaches me more than anyone else in my whole life has taught me and not that I ever knew her, but she teaches me as it were from beyond the grave that lightness is the strongest gesture. You know, lightness has an ethical power in our lives. I'm, I'm teaching this or suggesting this, thinking with my Stanford students about this all the time. So the third thing is something similar, Greenberg, who is very much Helen's boyfriend or man friend at this time is um, talking about the central problem for Jews in the West, he says. This is how he puts it. So specifically a Jewish problem, but I think this relates more broadly is like, um, is how to be on the one hand, not a, uh, <clears throat> not, not sort of a sort of political roustabout, like someone who's constantly um, uh, protesting, arguing, demanding, uh, resenting, declaiming all this. This is what Greenberg's saying. On the one hand, not to be that. On the other hand, not to be a sort of um, like walking, talking TED talk where um, every moment of your life, even with just the most casual acquaintance becomes in our phrase an overshare, you know, uh, and then this happened to me and then this happened to me. And then I somehow came through it. And then this happened and the, the poor uh, listener, maybe they're not, maybe they're edified, but maybe they're not is just kind of captive there. So in contrast to both this kind of political agitation and, and over self-revelation, Greenberg uses this German word called innerlichkeit, inner L-I-C-H-K-E-I-T, which we can translate just basically as inwardness. And this is a painting about inwardness. This is a painting that is about um, the freedom to find that lightness that is our inwardness, the freedom to find that lightness that is our inwardness. It has the courage to pursue that even though 99 people out of 100 are gonna think of this as a rag on the wall, but the one other person is gonna have their life changed. Art back then was a religion, it's not now. One of the interesting things about writing a book about then now is that one is always thinking about how to portray something I very much believe being so untimely myself that art continues to be a religion, but a religion, not in a dogmatic sense, but in the sense of being transformative and uh, the, light, the light touch, how to be light, uh, how to not work for Life Magazine or to feel that the only politics is in terms of a political campaign. This is what this painting has to um, present to us for our own thought. Now in Helen's own milieu, people misunderstood this, forget just the person on the street wondering what this painting even is because Helen's good friend, sometimes frenemy Grace Hartigan had painted just earlier that year in 1952, this comparably large, almost identically sized painting called Massacre, whose title alone suggests the totally different gestalt of this picture, right? It's, it's a painting that was literally made in sort of um, coffee driven cycles of exhilaration and despair. You know, it's about living on the edge, um, about not knowing, not having enough to eat, living in a cold water walk up flat, being poor. Uh, like the definition of life is in these sort of screaming serpentine and angular um, muddy uh, colors, right? And the artist's relation to this. Grace, not surprisingly, right? Notice how this is like kind of smuggling, a smuggled in art history lesson in this, in this talk, but it's like, you know, Grace, you know, she thought this is crap. I mean, this is terrible. I like Helen, but I mean, this is what Grace is confiding in her diary. Like, and other artists, Larry Rivers, the one she, Helen swore the vow with back in 1951, uh, you know, she, he wrote to her and said, Helen, what, what are you doing? I mean, 
art is about struggle. Like uh, it's not about decoration. So he was missing the lightness too. And this world where, you know, Helen's contemporaries, the other young artists in their twenties, it was um, created a very stressful atmosphere for sure. In this photograph, you see Helen looking not very pleased. Those are not her paintings. They are those of the man on the right Harry Jackson, who was um, real name Harry Shapiro, who uh, was a combat veteran from the South Pacific who fought at Tarawa and Saipan, who Clement Greenberg, Helen's uh, partner, had anointed as the best of all of these artists at the Tibor Dinaj Gallery where this photograph was taken. I mean, Helen's body posture alone suggests the sort of feeling of rivalry and ambitiousness and also let's not underestimate too how messed up a lot of these people were, which I don't say critically, but I mean, it's true that, um, you know, Harry Jackson from his war experience alone, let alone his growing up on the South side of Chicago was a profoundly traumatized uh, person. Um, so it's a lot of personalities. And if you look at the pose of Jackson and Helen there, I feel like too, their poses are emulating those of the canonical older uh, abstract artists in New York, most famously portrayed in this photograph by Nina Lean in 1951, including Pollock, Rothko, de Kooning, uh, second from right upper row, Robert Motherwell, who became Helen's husband in 1958. Uh, only one woman had a Stern who was a European emigre. But this, this high seriousness, not only of the older generation, but also um, the super kind of backstabbing, uh, psychologically messy competitiveness of the younger generation, you had to have a lot of chutzpah to even just walk into your studio and be alone with your picture, let alone to make mountains and sea. Uh, photographs like this taken a little later when the sort of alliances are beginning to take more shape and when there's beginning to be a market for paintings such as Helen's, that is the later 50s, are still deceiving. Yes, Hardigan there on the right and Helen in the middle were basically buddies, though Grace continued to say things like Helen's paintings look like they were made between cocktails and dinner. That was, that was, uh, that was mean. Helen didn't like that one. Um, but also Joan Mitchell, who, uh, you know, she's posed next to Helen there, but she just hated Helen and just thought she was the worst and actually disparaged her as that Kotex painter uh, that is in reference to Helen's uh, staining technique or her te technique of staining raw canvas. And let's not forget other challenges too. I mean, um, this photograph taken by a family photographer not long after Helen graduated from Bennington. So I'm bringing you all the way back to the very early fifties now showing her at bottom left with her um, older sisters, Mar um, Marjorie, who was the oldest on the right and then Gloria on the left, like, you know, they were already starting families by the time Helen was painting Mountains and Sea. Uh, they had several kids, actually Gloria's, uh, one of Gloria's children, uh, Clifford uh, was born on October 15th, uh, 11 days before, before Helen painted Mountains and Sea. And so it's kind of a lovely thing for me that Clifford Ross, uh, to whom I'm giving a shout out right now is actually just been, was just such a lovely um, person to talk to about all things Helen. And, you know, did they used to go uh, dancing together at um, uh, in the 1980s and so on. And did he think Helen was wonderful? Yes, it's true. So, so many amazing stories, but in any case, this is about family and the pressures to for Helen, as far as you can tell from looking at this photograph to be, um, you know, to follow in her older sister's footsteps, which she did not. And then there was Helen's mother too, who always exerted her own influence. And this is a photograph of 
the very formidable, beautiful, six foot tall Martha Frankenthaler on the right with Helen kind of crowding Helen, one might even say with that big hat and that just incredible physical presence just before Helen went on a trip to Europe um, between her junior and senior years of college. So that it says Bon Voyage on the cake. Um, Martha was demanding on the best of days, but starting in 1950, she began to not feel well. No one knew what the illness was, turned out to be Parkinson's. Uh, when Helen made the painting, just for her to go to the studio that day on West 23rd Street and make that painting, Mountains and Sea, required an, a kind of almost athletic effort of will to just absent oneself from one's family situation, from the expectations, from one's mother's illness and one's mother's expectation that one attend to her in the illness, everything, right? Um, take such a perfect storm of qualities to be an artist and Helen had those. And I'll just say last that when Mountains and Sea was shown um, in early 53, no one cared, you know, people made notices about the reviews such as they were, talked about the bright pastel colors and so on. At the very time, Helen was very depressed and she went to see this film called Limelight starring the older Charlie Chaplin and the very beautiful young British actress, then 21 years old, Claire Bloom. And, you know, in view of Claire Bloom's appearance here, maybe it's not surprising that Helen identified with her very much watching this film. And in the film, Claire Bloom plays a psychosomatically ill, incredibly talented ballerina who is convinced in this moment in the film that she can't get out of bed, that her legs are paralyzed, but it's purely psychosomatic. The Chaplin character is able to talk her out of this and to say the, the title that is the title of, or say the words that are the title of this talk, desire is the theme of all life. You know, you have something to offer, you have something to give. I think Helen, who describes sleeping a lot in the month, February 53, in which she saw this film, just sleeping, sleeping, you know how it is uh, being depressed. She had the gifts, she had the doubts, the neurotic fears that Claire Bloom's ballerina did. All of which brings us back to this picture. We know something about it now, but I think even if we hadn't heard this whole story that it can remind us of that lightness that exists within us, whether we realize it or avow it or not. And that constitutes probably for us as much as for Helen, a source of uh, life. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily and we'll take some questions. Thank you, Alex. Um... I, uh, that was really wonderful. Let's just jump right into some questions we have here. Uh, the first is, often it seems that visual artists have a heyday or peak period um, uh, that is all too brief, perhaps a single decade in their career. Do you see this in Frankenthaler's work? And when is that real uh, high influence? That's a really good question. Helen, if she were part of our, our chat, would vigorously dispute that she ever had a bad day, let alone a bad decade. So, cause she was painting all the way until 2011, but, or near then, which is when she died. But my book, you're right, does talk about just one decade. And for me, it's a matter of opinion, but I think that was her greatest decade. And the reason why is because she painted paintings as a young person in her twenties that articulate a young person's special relation to the qualities I've spoken about today. And her later work is magnificent in many ways. I love it in different ways, but this is the stuff that really pierces me because, you know, frankly, I remember what I was like in my twenties and I didn't have the wherewithal to be able to portray that with such kind of sublime abandon as Helen did. And she's helped me, if you like, recover the pathos, the beauty of that time. And so for me, that means that 
she did have a great decade. Um, but I accept the general proposition that for many artists, alas, they do burn it out in, in almost like in 10 years, like literally in 10 years. It's an, Pollock is a great example, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, we have a question that came in, the colors and to a lesser extent, the shape and form of Frankenthaler's mountain and sea seem similar to Devonkorn's Ocean Park series. Is there any chance she was an influence? I like that a lot. I've never thought about that before. Um, I think um, Diebenkorn would seem to come more directly out of Matisse, but, um, and I feel that in ways that are unfortunate, Helen's work has been somewhat sidelined in these understandings of how these artists, many of them men, um, learned from one another. So, uh, but I'd never thought of that. I really, I accept that there's something um, Mediterranean or Californian in Helen's light. I know just as an aside, she she loved to come to San Francisco where she, she would do shows at the Bergruen Gallery periodically. So she was not so native in New Yorker that she didn't love to come to the Bay Area. Hmm. Um, do you think Frankenthaler would have had the career that she did had it not been for her relationship with Greenberg? Uh, in particular, doors were opened to her by the endorsement and connections of a well-networked older male art world figure. Uh, what advice might you have for women and underrepresented artists looking to break through without such connections? Yeah, that's a really powerful question. Um, one could actually extend it and say that after the relationship with Greenberg ended in 1955, and it was a very loving but also destructive relationship, um, Frankenthaler ended up meeting, as I mentioned, Robert Motherwell and got married to him. And he was a very successful artist, also older than her, 13 years older. So here's my answer. People said then that Helen made only strategic alliances, that there was nothing of affection or, or let alone love in either one of these relationships. I don't think that's correct. However, there was something strategic in it too. It was complicated. Um, would she have become known? I Had she, or as well known, had she not started off with Greenberg? I, I don't think she was well known until much after their relationship ended. So the way I would put it is, he taught her a lot about, about how to make a picture and what a good picture was, which was ironic because he was an aspiring painter and wasn't anywhere near as good as her and was jealous of her talent. Mm -hmm. And yet he, he showed her this sort of royal road. You know, There is such a thing as a good critic, an insightful critic. So in terms of, I think that's the legacy. So translated to how an underrepresented an, an artist from an underrepresented group without the privilege of Helen, et cetera, might be able to make inroads, I would say, well, strategic alliances are never a bad idea, but I guess I believe in art that your mentors are people who shape your art, not your way of portraying your art, if that makes sense. And that, and that, um, you know, you, you have to think about what it is you have to say and how other people might be able to unlock something that is already in you, but is incapable of being portrayed without the, without the intervention of certain guides, mentors, who could be anyone, right? So that's what I would say. Thank you. Um, could you please speak a bit about the employment of uh, unprimed canvas? Uh, was it a conceptual statement, aesthetic, deliberately um, ephemeral and self-determinating uh, yeah. or all of the above? Yeah, so Helen said that day she walked into her studio, maybe she was lazy, that's what she said. She just didn't want to prime the canvas. Seems a little bit, seems a little bit unbelievable, but she had Pollock's example in mind. For me, it has to do with immediacy. You know, the soaking and staining is just defeats or prevents that 
over finished look, which you heard me speak about is to do with not freezing life. You know, the example I often use is that of a butterfly. It's the difference between collecting a butterfly in a net and then pasting it on in your album as a record of life versus somehow, you know, portraying the thing in flight, you know, without disturbing it, without breaking its wings. And I think the soaking is to do part, is one of the reasons why she's able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then just talking about um, the, me the medium, um, who started the, the soaking of, um, who started the soaking and with thin veils, uh, Helen or Luis Morris or others? Um, yeah, um, Helen, I mean, Pollock first, and then Helen did her thing. And then Morris Lewis and Kenneth Noland came up uh, and um, from Washington one day to see Helen's painting. In fact, the very one I talked about today and came away with, well, Morris Lewis did with his very beautiful his idea to make these veil paintings, which you can see there are two of them at the Anderson collection, um, along with one by uh, one of Helen's abstractions. Um, yes, um, so they're all connected that way, but Pollock would have the, the order of priority. The image says mountains and sea, so it makes a map of the outer world. I also see a body or bodies, sure, surely a face in, a green, in, the, in green top right with the colors denoting the inner organs, or else it brings to mind the cell, nucleus, um, organelles. Um, in the, so in that sense, is an, it, it's, an, it's an inner map at a varying at scales, mm -hmm. especially in light of your comments in, about inwardness. Could you see it like this too? Any thoughts? Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, those the first marks she made are the sort of charcoal drawn uh, infrastructure or skeleton of the design, which are very done very improvisationally. You can almost feel the movement of the shoulder, elbow, and wrist in making them, and they owe to surrealist techniques of automatic writing. It was called, which is very um, is not only about inwardness, but is also tends to conform to what to biomorphic shapes, so a biological reference. So I don't think those references to organs and bodies are at all misplaced. I think it's almost like the picture is suggesting that an intimate kind of sensuous encounter with a, the physical body, and you have to imagine Helen's physical body, you know, on this work, like literally on it and related to it, almost laminated to it, is really not that different from the emotional affect of the Marx portrayed, you know? Um, I'm trying to think of an example from daily life where this would be the case, but perhaps one could just say, we, we perhaps too readily distinguish between physical and mm -hmm. let's say internal or emotional impressions. Um, and I think she's trying to toggle between those or such that they become both biological and psychological at the same time. So there are a couple of questions that um, kind of link together. Um, while some of the first reactions to mountains and sea were critical and negative, as you shared, it is now viewed as a masterpiece. Um, how and why did the critical appreciation of the painting evolve? And then how did Helen continue to believe in herself and her work despite the criticism from friends and other artists? Yeah, so on the first one, it's true. It, it has a masterpiece um, designation and always hanging in the National Gallery of Art as long as, since I've been in grad school at least. But I don't know. I mean, if you ask someone to talk about it, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't particularly see people looking at it much when I'm in Washington or you know, I think paintings are, um, they're a little bit like the Proverbs of Jesus, you know, that you, you kind of have to mull them. They're not, they don't give of themselves, right? They're, um, art, art requires a journey, right? So if you don't want to take the journey, then it's not going to do anything for you. And I think this painting remains difficult uh, for people so it's institutionally accredited as a masterpiece, but that doesn't mean it has any particular, 
people regard it with awe or anything like that. And um, even for much more famous paintings like Picasso's Guernica, it's a little hard to know when you're actually standing, or the Mona Lisa, for example, it's a little bit hard to know, like, well, now what am I supposed to feel? Like, am I, you know, what's supposed to happen? Art is a very strange and it's like, it's like the little mouth of a cave, you know, like um, the caves at Lascaux and Altamira with all the beautiful cave paintings, the oldest paintings on earth were discovered by little, by dogs basically chasing after rabbits, you know, and um, the little boy following the dog eventually goes down there with a torch. It's, um, uh, you know, you could walk past that same place a thousand times and not see, not know it, right? So. I think for me, teaching at Stanford is so much about um, how to regard that chance, that serendipity as yes, a privilege, but not anything to apologize for. Mm -hmm. Because I believe, I guess I believe in art. I believe in an, an experience to be transformative. So it can seem off-putting uh, like, hey, I don't get it, let's move on. I get that, but I think that the difficulty of art is not necessarily anti-democratic. Just briefly on the second question, um, you know, Helen just, she had that aristocratic confidence that her parents instilled on in her ever since she was a little kid, you know, I'm gonna be, you know, her dad used to say, watch her, she's gonna be famous. She's gonna be fantastic, her, and if you're, Helen said later that was a real help to her. It was also, it was also not good, <laughs> you know, like if your parents load that onto you, it's not always the greatest thing, but um, it certainly helped her. She never doubted, never doubted that she was a great painter. That's one reason people didn't like her sometimes, of course. Um, and so that actually brings up interestingly to this question of, did Helen find a community of generally supportive female artists or friends? Do you, I mean, outside of the, kind of mentors that you mm -hmm. well I think she and Grace Hardigan were friends like I said Joan Mitchell who was even wealthier than Helen hated her um, in the later 60s and early 70s the time of feminism that's when Helen began to get real rec her real recognition a show at the Whitney for example interviews articles but she always resisted the idea that she was a feminist in any way. And she hated the phrase woman painter. She felt she was a painter, you know, period. And her experience as a woman informs her work richly, of course, she acknowledged, because there's no difference between art and life. But uh, she was, she, she, she gained by virtue of feminism, but she stayed regally apart from that too. What do you see in the shapes in the canvas? A bouquet of viscera, sort of like wearing one's heart on one's sleeve? Do you mm. see that in there? I see, yeah, I see the bouquet. I certainly, the viscera reminds me of the earlier comment about the biomorphic forms. I also see that, that kind of ball, almost circular shape there at the bottom on top of which there's this platform and to me, this suggests like the delicacy, the delicate balance or equilibrium of the whole thing, you know, that these moments are so fragile. Uh, these moments of sensation and emotion are so fragile, mm -hmm. not only unto themselves, but in terms of how the world regards them, because it's not Life magazine, it's not Adlai Stevenson, it's almost nothing. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that uselessness as profound, as transformative, as, um, as making life worth living, which is how Helen, I think basically what Helen's work suggests that, you know, um, it's a defeat of the darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, one is, could you please speak about the motivation of the color field painters? Was it aesthetic, conceptual, deliberately self-negating? The color field painters, so meaning not Helen, but um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess. And then um, 
you know, the fall, additionally, is any interesting anecdotes on Frankenthaler's influence on Morris Lewis? Um, so I don't know if that helps. Provide. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan tried to absent themselves from, to make really impersonal works. Um, you know, the Nolan targets remind me of, say, seeing a shield hanging on the wall of a baronial castle. You know, they're, they're not psychological. They're not expressive, they're, they're resplendent artifacts. Helen's works are much more confessional and diaristic without again being an overshare, you know, which she deplored uh, as a gimmick, you know. Hey, let me tell you about the time that this happened to me. She thought that was just vulgar and stupid. Like that's, um, you know, she was interested in drawing on her personal experience without making it be about her, right? In order to give something to the rest of us. Uh, I think on the other point, um, you know, the only way mountains and sea is talked about really is a way that I studiously avoided in my book, which is that um, uh, Greenberg himself said that it was a bridge between Pollock and Lewis and Noland. And, mm -hmm you know, Helen wasn't even the intermediary there. She was just the baton. And although she didn't take any offense at this, I'm going to take offense on her behalf and say that I, you know, I couldn't even write that old saw in my book um, because let's, let's look at the painting instead and just treat it as, as something that we need to engage with on its own terms. Yeah. And then our final question of today is, how do you think Helen being in New York City after college influenced her versus if she had been in any other city, especially in regards to her art? Yes, um, people often see a disconnect, for example, with mountains and sea and Manhattan, they feel, um, I mentioned Nova Scotia here, and it's true, she maintained really strong ties to Bennington uh, throughout her life. And the pastoral of Vermont was very important to her. Yeah, I think um, she was someone who mediated between her uptown uh, aristocratic roots and the bohemian world of the Lower West Side very comfortably. Picture her having some Chianti and some spaghetti and some good uh, bread at a, a, a restaurant in Greenwich Village with Greenberg. And I know that's like a central casting kind of Netflix worthy kind of scene I've just portrayed of what being a painter in New York was like in 1951. But yeah, it's true. So she she got the best, she, she blended those two worlds. Alex, I just wanna thank you again for joining us this afternoon and exploring this piece of art and sharing your insights into the life and work of Helen Frankenthaler. It's been really fascinating and, and we're grateful for your time and expertise. Thank you, Emily, it's a pleasure. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Alex, and thank you everyone for joining us.